Welcome back. Let's start off with the iterative approach. That is no recursion. If we want to run the function, let's say find factorial iterative five, well, we can create a variable, let's say answer. And for now, this answer will be one. And all we're going to do is do a for loop. We'll say let i equals zero. Or in our case, to simplify things, let's start at two. And I'm going to explain in a second why we want to start at two. I'm going to say i is less than the number. And then we're going to increment i by one. Now, why are we starting at two? You might notice a shortcut here. One factorial is just one. Two factorial is two times one, which is just two. So these last two bits, if somebody says one factorial or two factorial, we can just simply return the number that they've entered because there's no real calculation that we need to do. So this is a little shortcut. So we avoid extra loops, but just saying that if the number that the user enters is let's say two, so that is two is not greater than number two. The way we have it now, if somebody enters find factorial iterative two, we're going to return one. But instead, we can just say maybe a simple conditional check saying that if number equals to two, we'll just say that answer equals to two. So that if I run this function and just say two, I get two. If I say one, I get one. And there's other checks that we can do, obviously. But for our case, this is good enough. Let's look at what we can do inside of here. Well, the way factorial works is to simply say answer is going to equal answer times i. So that if I click run here and let's do five, I get 24, which is actually not the right answer because five times four is 20 times three is well, clearly higher than 24. And that's because of a little mistake here, we want to make sure that this is equals, because we want to include the number five. So if I run this again, so if I run this again, I get 120, which is the right answer. Five times four is 20 times times three is 60 times two is 120 times one is just 120. Perfect. So hopefully you got that answer correct. What about the recursive approach? In the recursive version, we'll just do a simple check saying if number is equal to two, and we can do other checks as well. But that should be enough for now for us to create a base case. So if the number gets to two, we'll just return two. There's our base case. That's how we stop. Next, we're going to return version, which will simply be number times the function. And in this function, we're just going to say number minus one. And that's the key here. We want to always get lower and lower until we hit the base case. So if I hit run here, let's do recursive this time. I'm going to move this up over here. And if I hit run, I also get 120. And this is a little hard to wrap your mind around. So you might want to copy this code and open up Google Chrome developer tools, like I showed you and go step by step. But if we start with the number five here, well, does five equal two? Nope. Then we'll say five 
times times find factorial 4 should be our answer, just like the diagram that I showed you. And we keep going and keep going until we hit the base case of does the number equal 2. Now, one last bit. What do you think the time complexity of these two functions are? Well, one uses a for loop with the loop being the number associated with it. And we're doing a bit of a shortcut here, so it's technically less than O of n, but because of our big O rules, this is still going to be O of n. The recursive function, if we look at this, we are looping how many times? Well, we're calling the function function find factor recur recursive the same number of times as the number itself. So this also becomes O of n. If you got this question, good job. It's a tough one. If you didn't, don't worry. We have another one coming up. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Welcome back. You can't talk about recursion without talking about the Fibonacci sequence. What is the Fibonacci sequence? Well, it's this, this sequence right here. The pattern, if you notice, is that we're always adding the first two items equals this one. So zero plus one equals one, one plus one equals two, one plus two equals three, 2 plus 3 equals 5, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. So the previous two numbers always equals the current number. So I have another exercise for you. This one a little bit tougher than the previous one. Given a number n that the function is going to receive, return the index value of the Fibonacci sequence. So if I say that I want the n to equal 2, it's going to give me 0, 1, 2. That is the number 1. This function is going to return 1. If I say Fibonacci number 8, I would get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I would get 21. The function will tell me what number is associated with the index that I give it. Once again, I have the iterative approach that is using just simple for loops and also the recursive approach. I challenge you to try both of these and see if you can do it. And a big hint here is that the recursive approach is actually easier than the iterative approach. So good luck out there. And I'll see you in the solution video. Bye-bye. Welcome back. How was that exercise? Does your brain hurt from all this confusing sequence? Let's actually start off with the recursive function this time. Because in this case, the recursive function is actually a lot simpler to think about. All we would do with our recursive function is to say, well, the base case is going to say number or n is going to equal 2. If that's the case, simply return. Actually, if we look at the sequence, we see that if the index is 0, the answer is 0. If the index is 1, the answer is 1. And if the index is 2, then the answer changes to 1. So instead, our base could be, if n is less than 2, we're always going to just return whatever the n is. So if we say 0, it's going to return 0. If we say 1, it's going to return 1. If we have an index higher than that, well, then we have to do some recursion. 
And all we're going to do here is have another return statement and say this function, I know that this function is really, really long. We can probably make it shorter to just say fib. And I noticed that we don't need the iterative here. That will make it a little shorter. There you go. And all we're going to say is fib is going to equal n minus one plus the same thing n minus two. Because remember, the sum is always, the answer is always, the answer is always the numbers one and two before it. So we're just adding the numbers one and two before our sequence. And that's it. If we run this function, let's say Fibonacci recursive of three, and I click run, I get two because zero, one, two, three is two. Let's do eight, which should give us 21. And I click run or give eight, I get 21. Nice. And if I do zero, I get zero. If I do one, I get one. If I do two, I should get one right here. Nice and simple. Well, I don't know about simple, right? You really have to get comfortable. You really have to get comfortable with this before you truly understand what's happening. But I have a little diagram to help you here. All we've done is simply this. If I added seven here, our recursive function is going to get one less than seven and two less than five. And then within those functions, do the same thing. One less than six, two less than six. One less than five, two less than three. And it's doing all of these, all of these, all of these until we get to fib of one, two, where we have our base case that returns that number. So this becomes one, this also becomes one, and then it keeps going, keeps going, keeps returning until we get to fib of seven. Now this is a diagram that we're gonna get back to, but you see we're doing a lot of calculations here. But simply put, this is all we're doing. Actually simple, simpler than the iterative approach. Let's have a look at what the iterative approach would look like. We'll create an array. And there's many ways of doing this. This is my preferred way. And this array is going to have the initial items of the sequence zero and one. And this is going to first of all, return the array and item of n, we're creating this array and then grabbing whatever index the user wants. In our case, if the user requests zero or one, we already have the array prefilled with zero and one, and it's going to return the same. But we still need to calculate for all the other ones. That's where we do a for loop and say let i equal two because we're going to start adding when the index is zero, one, two to one, two to start filling this array. We'll say i is less than n plus one, or we can do equals here if we want. We'll leave it at that for now, and we'll increment i plus plus. And in this loop, we're gonna keep going until we hit the number of index that we're interested in. And all we're going to say is array.push array i minus two plus array i minus one. Similar to what we did before, we're just summing the previous two numbers and pushing it to the array. All right, now let's see if this works. I'm going to comment out this one and just do the iterative approach. I get two for three. What about index of eight? I get 21, perfect. And then if I do index of zero, index of one, and index of two should be one. Perfect. Now I said that the recursive approach is simpler than the iterative approach. Now that's my personal opinion. 
you might not think that. You might think that this was quite easy. But to me, this reads a lot nicer than all this thing that we're doing. And this is something we're going to get into in the next video, where we talk about the trade-offs between the iterative and the recursive approaches to these problems. And why, maybe you're wondering right now, why would we ever write anything recursive if you find this confusing? We'll get to that. But the one thing I want to show you is something that we just learned here that is new to us. What do you think the big O of these two functions are? Well, in our iterative solution, iterative solution, the big O is linear time, right? It's O of n. Basically, we're just iterating through the loop n minus two times because we're skipping the first two items, which in turn makes it O of n. But what about the recursive approach? Remember the diagram I showed you? That's a lot more calculations than just the seven, right? We have a lot of function calls that happen. In this case, in the recursion solution, it takes what we call exponential time. The size of the tree exponentially grows when n increases. If Fibonacci number was eight, we would have this tree as well as an other tree underneath a fib of eight. So what is the big O of that? This is very exciting because we're learning about a new big O notation. We're learning about this one, exponential time, which can be seen with recursive algorithms that solve a problem of size n, two to the power of n. If we go to our big O cheat sheet, this is O two to the power of n. You see how much it increases? That's pretty bad. It's bigger than even O of n squared, the two nested for loops. Exponential time means every additional element in the Fibonacci sequence, we get an increase in function calls exponentially. And here's a fun little trick. Although this is O of n, the iterative approach, this function, because it's O of two to the power of n, if I run this function, let's say if we do 10, I get a result. If I do 15, I still get a result. What if I do 20 here? All right, it's starting to get bigger and bigger. If I do 30, if I do 40, do you see how much longer that took to calculate? Because our time complexity is increasing more and more. If I do 43 now, you'll see that we're waiting and waiting and waiting for the calculation to happen. And eventually the browser comes up with the calculation. As a bonus question, think about how many calculations, bonus question, think about how many calculations Fibonacci 43 required. This, although might be more readable, is not an ideal solution. As you can see, big O time complexity is pretty big. And this is something that you might get asked in an interview. And I know what you're thinking. Andre, you just taught us about recursion and it's not even good. It's slow, it's confusing. Why would I ever want to use recursion? In the next video, I'm gonna talk about this trade-off. Why would you ever use recursion over something that is iterative? Why would any sane person do that? And as you'll find out, there are some pros and cons. And as a matter of fact, a function like this such as Fibonacci sequence and recursion can be made to O of N using something, using something like dynamic programming and memoization, which we're going to talk about towards the end of this course. And we're going to get back to this, but let's finally answer the question in the next video. Why would you ever use recursion 
over something iterative. Welcome back. There's a theorem that states anything that can be implemented recursively can be implemented iteratively. That is, you can go your whole life without implementing recursive functions and just use loops. Okay, so why would we ever want to confuse ourselves with a topic like recursion that can be a little confusing? Well, for some problems, it's actually easier to write, but it really depends on the situation. Keep in mind that there's always two options. And by now, you know that with programming, there's always pros and cons. And a good engineer is somebody who can make the right decisions based on those pros and cons. But I want you to keep this in mind for interviews. Because interviewers will ask you, to solve a problem. And a problem that can be solved with recursion can usually be solved iteratively as well. And looking at our Fibonacci function, this is a simpler example of recursion, but there are times when recursion can keep your code dry. That is, do not repeat yourself. A big rule when it comes to programming. And there are a lot of problems when it comes to recursion as they get harder and harder when using recursive functions allow your code to be more readable and also dry, simpler, have less loops happening with confusing code. And I'm a little bit biased because although recursion is a powerful technique, in my opinion, it's not always the best approach. So you need to make sure because, because of, or its main drawback. That is, although recursion can keep your code dry and make your code more readable, it also creates this extra memory footprint. Because every time we add a function to the call stack, it adds extra piece of memory. So you have cases where you can get stack overflows or if your system has expensive memory, you want to avoid making too many recursive calls. And for some people, recursion is also something that is hard to wrap their mind up around. And if you have a team of young engineers of developers that aren't familiar with recursion, that may not be the best option. But the main drawback is this, that iterative approaches tend to be more efficient because they don't make these additional function calls that take up the stack space with the downside iterative solutions might be not as readable. And the rule that I like to follow is that I like to use recursion when you're working with data structures that you're not really sure how deep they are, where you don't know how many loops to go through. And as you'll see, recursion is really useful for things such as tree data structures and doing traversal because that is often the case. Now, in the next video, I want to talk about this topic a little bit deeper and when to use recursion. But I do want to point one thing quickly. There's something called tail call optimization in many languages. And for example, in JavaScript with ES6, it allows recursions to be called without increasing the call stack. You can read more about it in the resources that I'll provide to you in this video. But in other languages as well, there are certain ways to write recursion solutions so they're more memory efficient. So this large stack issue can actually be resolved during production. But let's talk about a definitive guide to when to use recursion in the next video. When should we use recursion? This is the rule that I like to use. When it gets to complicated problems like traversing or searching through trees or graphs, something that we're going to talk about with breadth first search and depth first search, 
recursion is really, really useful and better than iterative approaches. And with sorting through items, there's also cases that we will see that recursion is preferred. And when it comes to recursion, these are the rules that I like to follow. Every time we're using a tree or converting something into a tree, consider recursion. And there's three key things in an interview question that might trigger a recursive solution. One is that a problem can be divided into a number of subproblems that are smaller instances of that same problem, such as the exercises we've done with Fibonacci numbers or factorial. We can break those down into little trees that break down to smaller and smaller pieces. Those are inherently recursive problems. Another factor is that each of these instances of subproblem is identical in nature. That is, the calculations that we need to do are pretty much the same. They may be smaller values, but the actual calculations underneath it is all the same over and over and over. And then finally, the third point is that those solutions, if you solve the smaller problems, the leaf nodes of that tree, and you combine them, that solves the problem at hand, then that is a recursive solution that you can use. And you'll see a lot of divide and conquer using recursion. Remember divide and conquer, which we mentioned when we got to the tree data structure lessons. It's kind of like looking through a phone book. When you're looking for Bill in the phone book, you're not going to start from A and simply go one page at a time from left to right. No, you usually split the phone book in the middle or try to go to the B section of the phone book and start dividing up the problem page by page until you get closer and closer. This divide and conquer type of questions usually have recursion in them. And as we know, the one thing that recursions can do that looping can't is that they can make tasks super, super easy, such as these types of problems. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to write your own traverse function that we use in our tree data structure. This is something that we're going to get to when we get to searching in the algorithm section. But if you want to challenge yourself, see if you can write a traverse function like I did over here using recursion. And then also try to write it with loops. You'll see that with loops, things like tree traversal is a headache. I can't even do it from the top of my head. With recursion, it's pretty straightforward. With loops, you usually have to maintain some sort of a stack to keep track of things. And it really adds a lot of complexity. So use the rules below to notice when a recursive problem presents itself during an interview. I'll leave a few more exercises for you after this video. But as we'll see, we'll come back to this topic when we get into other algorithm sections. And things will start to get clearer. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.